don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these conversations for complexity and nuance. Hello again, and thanks so much for your time and attention in listening to our podcast. I do appreciate it. A few housekeeping notes before we get into this week's episode. We're publishing this on March 27th, and if you're listening to us in a timely manner, I invite you to join us tonight in our Thought Stretchers Education Community event on reading instruction. We'll dive into neuroscience and evidence and reading instruction with Dr. Karen Gazeth, who is an education professor and author of a book that dives into that exact topic, as well as Christy Biggerstaff, who is the Director of Early Literacy for the Kentucky Department of Education, and Sonia Thomas, who is the CEO of Nashville Propel, which is a parent advocacy group. As you'll hear in this week's podcast episode coming up, Our Thought Stretchers community discussions are just that, and they're meant to be discussions with your participation. So you'll hear in this week's episode other folks besides the guests adding their voice. And again, I invite you to join us tonight and for our future events. All of those can be found at thoughtstretchers.org. We've added a new event since we published our last podcast. That is May 23rd. We'll be talking about anti-racism education with Dr. Sheena Mason, who is a professor and author of The Raceless Anti-Racist, soon to be published. She was on the podcast back when we were Teach Thought PD. And Dr. Damon Harris, who is a more recent podcast guest, who is an educator and author of a book called The Anti-Racist School Leader. Once again, I invite you to join an RSVP to do that at thoughtstretchers.org. And please don't forget about our main professional development website, which is wegrowteachers.com. There you can find all of our professional development workshops and services like project-based learning, inquiry, differentiated instruction, and much, much more, as well as our blog content and this podcast as well. We also have our online courses there, and you can find those along the top menu. We've recently added a Creating a Culture of Inquiry online course, as well as the PBL On Demand course, which has been revamped and relaunched in February. Both of those courses are on sale right now for a greatly reduced time, for a limited time. So again, go to wegrowteachers.com, and you'll find those along the top in the menu. As always, you can reach out to me at drew at thoughtstretchers.org if you have any comments, questions, or concerns. This week's episode is the archived audio from a Thought Stretchers Education Community event that we hosted on February 25th, 2024. This was titled The Side Effects of School, and we pondered the question, Does Traditional Schooling Lead to Poor Mental Health for Students? This was a participatory online discussion, so you'll hear the voices of the two guests, who are Naomi Fisher, a clinical psychologist, and Michael Strong, who is an educator in a number of roles in which we talk about in the introductions. You'll also hear some of the participant guests, and if you are so inclined, we'd love to have you join us for future events. I do want to note that there is some extraneous noise in this audio recording, We tried to clean it up as best we could, and I don't think it's much of a distraction, but we had a number of participants using Google Meet, and for just a couple of them, there was some audio noise that you may notice here and there. With all of that said, I'd like to once again invite you to join the Thought Stretchers education community by going to thoughtstretchers.org and adding your voice there and in future online discussion events. And now here's our discussion on the side effects of school. All right, well, let's get started. My name is Drew Perkins. I'm the director of Thought Stretchers Education, and um, thank you all for joining us here for this interesting, what promises to be an interesting conversation with Naomi and Michael on the side effects of school and uh, some of the things that Naomi frequently posts about and gets all kinds of pushback from, and uh, Michael, who I'm going to have both of them introduce themselves as, uh, here in a moment. Uh, the the work that we do uh, 
is all of professional development. So uh, Thought Stretches Education does professional development in a number of areas, lots of it, uh, project-based learning, differentiated instruction, uh, everything through the lens of inquiry, and you can find that at wegrowteachers.com. And as you all have signed up for the Thought Stretchers Education community, that's a new venture that we've launched late last year in an effort to provide a better place uh, or a platform for better conversations on education and education-related matters. People say that we need a place like that, so um, we're pr- trying to provide it and try to grow it. So. We appreciate you signing up and joining uh, for this event and hopefully future events. And uh, we hope that you would go to thoughtstretchers.org and um, hopefully uh, engage. Uh, that's going to be a, a process, getting enough people in there to engage and have interesting and useful conversations. But that is the goal. So hopefully we'll do that. And, of course, there is the podcast, which you can find at the Thought Stretchers Education Podcast. It's on our website in places, uh, both those places, but Apple Podcasts and all the usual places. So uh, my goal is to have better conversations, and this is one of those efforts. And uh, Naomi, I saw her posts on Twitter and all of the firestorm that uh, inceded or su- succeeded or uh, something I'm not sure I'm probably not using the right word there but uh, if you follow her you're probably very familiar and probably have several words you could use for it uh, Michael was uh, one of my previous podcast guests and we were talking about some of his work which is with the University of Austin's Adolescent Flourishing Initiative but I'm going to ask both of them to introduce themselves and we'll uh, then ask them to respond and kind of give their uh, I guess brief rundown of what it is that, uh, that how they think about this sort of side effects in their position. Uh, I'm going to try to do some devil's advocacy pushback and questions as much as I can um, at some point uh, because we have a, a small enough group here. I think it makes sense to ask you if you are so inclined to unmute and participate and ask any questions of either or both of them or, or myself as well. So uh, we'll do that at some point here. And and um, if you have questions or things you want to uh, put in the chat box, of course, that is uh, that's an option as well. But let's start with uh, I guess let's start with Michael and Michael, give everybody a, a quick rundown of who you are and the work that you do, Socratic experience and Adolescent Flourishing Initiative and anything else. Terrific. Thank you. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. Delighted to have you here. Really delighted to have this conversation with everyone here. Um, first background as an educator, I've been in education for 35 years. My particular love, expertise, and uh, what I live and breathe for is Socratic dialogue. I love thinking and talking about ideas. Um, so um, in the late 1980s, I began leading Socratic seminars in Chicago public schools. That led to a job training teachers in Alaska to lead Socratic seminars. While there, I felt as if I was liberating prisoners. Kids were starving to think and talk. Um, and to be recognized and listened to. And so I wrote a book, The Habit of Thought, um, after a group of kids said this is the first time in their life an adult had ever listened to them. Um, Then uh, I became involved in the Montessori movement. Maria Montessori really did uh, infant through elementary. Uh, Secondary was relatively undefined. A lot of Montessorians saw my Socratic approach as very respectful of children and developing independent thought after the independence developed in Montessori. So uh, I've created a number of different Montessori secondary programs, including most recently uh, the high school model for the largest Montessori network in the United States. And uh, in 2020, I started uh, the Socratic Experience, a virtual version. In general, virtual education is terrible, but dialogue works pretty well virtually. So insofar as our school, we do two to four hours of 15 to one dialogue. The kids love it. They're super engaged. Um, Kind of another side narrative to that history that gets into the Adolescent Flourishing Initiative. Over the decades, creating mostly small, highly personalized schools where children had a lot of agency, I've seen hundreds of kids who are anxious, depressed, suicidal, come to a small personalized school and within a few weeks or months become happy and well. Um, In many cases, these families uh, had resources, so they'd been to therapy, they'd been to sometimes treatment centers and all kinds of things. And uh, it was only when the child went to a different kind of environment, what was much more I touch, personalize, go at your own pace, respectful of who they are, a warm community, that they become better. And so I started reading about, um, and this is before the whole smartphone thing, 
I started reading about different aspects of uh, adolescent well-being and things that came up for me in a big way were connection, community, meaning, and purpose. And um, over the time I was writing and speaking and I became associated with a number of scholars who specialized in this and scholars from different disciplines um, said, of course, young people need purpose. Of course, they need meaning. Of course, they need community. There's a whole literature on school connectedness. Uh, school connectedness and parent connectedness um, are predictors of all sorts of adolescent uh, issues. If you're not connected at school and uh, with your parents, much more likely for all kinds of things to happen. And so gradually I approached the University of Austin and I said, look, I know 50 scholars who have psych, sociology, education, you know, different disciplines who were interested in this, but there was no there there. There was nobody really looking at how different school environments could lead to better adolescent mental health. And so I proposed this project and started it last summer, and I'm currently raising funds and gathering scholars so we can really focus on how different schooling environments impact adolescent well-being in a different way. Um, one other little bell and whistle, and then I'll let Naomi go. Uh, because we're in Austin, a lot of tech entrepreneurs, one of the things I'm looking at is a um, wearable uh, algorithm that measures psychological safety and emotional engagement. And I look forward to actually measuring how engaged and safe kids feel in different environments. Um, but I'll talk more about that later. Uh, I'll let Naomi go. Thank you. Naomi? Thank you, Michael. That was really interesting. Um, so my name's Naomi Fisher. I'm a clinical psychologist. And as people always say, you're not an educator and you're not an educational psychologist. And that's true. I'm a clinical psychologist, which means I specialize in behavior and mental health. And that's where my background was. So I had a slightly unusual educational experience myself. I went to 11 different schools when I was growing up. My parents moved around a lot. And I think what that started me off with was a healthy skepticism for things that schools say are essential. Because I went to many different schools and they all said that some things were utterly essential and they were often things that the previous school had not even noticed or not, you know, like we went, went to schools with a very strict uniform, schools with no uniform at all, schools where we were learning to read to, when we were age five, schools where they didn't teach you to read until you were eight. Just a massively different experience all the way through my education. And then when I became, so when I became a psychologist, I did a PhD in developmental cognitive psychology, uh, specializing in autism, and then I did my clinical psychology degree. And I thought, you know, I'm specializing in mental health, went into the NHS and specialized in trauma, so the National Health Service in the UK, and I specialized in working with trauma. Um, and then I had my own children, and my eldest is now 15, and I started to look at the school system and to what was going to happen to my children in the school system. And I started to be concerned that there was a real mismatch between what I had learned children needed to thrive and what was being offered to us in the school system. Not so much in early years. The first few years, I think, were pretty good. But once they got to about they were age five, which is still pretty early, um, it was going to be learning out of context. It was a lot of focus on sitting in desks and I had a very active little boy and I could just see already from my experience of working in the health service how this might be going to go wrong. So I decided not to do that and I home educated my children for quite a few years and as I did that I started to think much more deeply about the school system and I started to write about the school system and about psychology and what we know about developmental psychology, particular developmental cognitive psychology and I read as widely as I could about what was happening in our school system. And the one thing I was really surprised about actually was I read a lot of books. I read Daniel Willingham's book, um, The Cognitive Science, and I, I discovered that there was a whole thing in schools about cognitive science and how people learn. And it didn't really add up to what I had learned in my developmental cognitive psychology. It was like they were completely different things. And I became concerned about how there was only one side being presented in schools. So I wrote my books, I wrote a couple of books about self-directed learning, learning outside school, and as I saw my children learning, I could see how different learning could be. And because I wrote these books, um, people started to come to me with problems with school. So I started having clients with families, with children mostly, who would say, my child's really unhappy at school, can you help? And 
I'm a clinical psychologist, so I'm trained in cognitive behavior therapy, in trauma therapy, and generally what they were saying is, can you make my child better so that they can be happy in school? Can you make them less anxious? Can you treat their trauma so that they will be happy in school? And then they started telling me what was happening in school, and I was really concerned because what they were telling me was happening in school were practices that seemed to me were destructive of our of children's mental health. So a lot of very micromanaged behavior control, a lot of public behavior control, so your name up on the board if you've been badly behaved. One little boy I worked with told me how his, um, his class were all punished if one child didn't do, you know, if everybody didn't get above a certain mark for the week, the whole class lost their golden time on Friday afternoons, which was their time when they could do what they wanted. He was about eight or nine, and he, his whole class hated him. They shunned him because he was the child who meant that they never got their golden time. And then I was being asked, treat this child's anxiety so that they'll go back. And I was saying, but there's nothing wrong with this child. Anyone who's in this environment is going to feel anxious and depressed. What are, why are these things going on in schools that mean that our children are having these experiences? And I felt complicit. I felt as a clinical psychologist, I was asked to be complicit in this because I was asked to essentially locate the problem in the child. So this child's got something wrong with them. I can treat it or I can't treat them. Maybe I can give them a diagnosis or something which says the problem is you, the environment's okay. And yet the more I heard about the environment, the more I was concerned about it. And that had really continued. And then I started talking about that. And I realized that it's quite a transgressive thing to do, actually, to talk about the impact that schools environments can have on some children. Um, and, that I, and in a way, the more of a kickback I got, so I post about things on Twitter, and I get a really, really defensive kickback of people telling me that I'm wrong, that I'm being attacking teachers. I absolutely don't want to attack teachers in any way. I think teachers do an amazingly difficult, challenging job. And I completely acknowledge that I'm not a teacher. And I'm not trying to tell teachers how to teach. I see myself more as waving red flags, saying, look, there's a problem going on over here. And no one's asking us, right? In health, there is no feedback system from health to education. So for example, if the local schools introduce in the UK, there's a real push towards many schools introducing very high control behavior strategies. We see that wave in the child psychology clinics. <laughs> we see the children coming and saying, we have, you know, I've got this app now and I get behavior points every time I do something. And then I go from going in isolation and I'm terrified and I can't sleep at night because I'm worried I'm going to be in isolation but nobody is asking for our feedback. So it feels to me like there are these side effects of what's being done in schools and nobody seems to be looking for the side of, for the, someone, nobody seems to be looking for the unwanted effect because a lot of education research focuses on test results and exam results. And when they bring it, whenever I talk about anything, in fact, people say, well, what about exam results? What about test results? And I'm like, for a start, exam results for the whole population are a futile goal because we have exam results set up in a way one third of the population, at least in the UK, is not going to pass their end of year, their end of school exams because the system is set up like that to basically sort them out. That's what it's for. So if we say all children must succeed in their end of year, end of school exams, we've, we've set up a system of failure for those 30%. They're not going to, they're not going to do it because that's how the exams work. Um, but also, if we've got a system that is using anxiety, and then we're asking psychologists to treat anxiety, somehow it seemed to me this had to be joined up. There has to be some feedback. And in, in England, at least, if there are side effects from medicines, doctors have this yellow card system. They can put stuff, in, basically, if lots of patients are coming back and say, you know, you gave me that medicine, but it's giving me palpitations, it's giving me hot sweats. The doctors are meant to send that back so that we're collecting side effects. And I feel like there's nobody collecting the side effects of what's happening in our education system. And a bit like Michael, I've also seen now, because my, my own children have stayed in unconventional education all the way through, and I have seen many children coming out of that school environment and like a transformation happen. 
and I've seen them learning and I've seen them engaging and becoming curious. And the, the three things you were referring to there, Michael, it's self-determination theory, yes? Connection, community, mm -hmm. meaning and purpose. I yep. think that's what we need to be putting at the heart of education. And if we started with those three things, then other things would follow. And at the moment, it feels that like we're starting with exam results and we're saying everything else can be secondary to that exam result. So what if we've got some collateral damage of serious mental health problems in some kids? And I'm saying that that's not enough. We can't we can't carry on with that. So that's why I keep waving those flags. <laughs> well, thanks for that, Naomi. Uh, and just a little background on me. So I was a teacher for 15 years and uh, I tried very hard not to be a teacher because my mom and grandmother were teachers, but it eventually drew me back in. My dad was a psychologist. And so I began in uh, special education, emotional behavior disorder students, moved into middle and then high school, regular ed, social studies, including teaching of psychology. So I guess it was just destined that I was going to be a teacher of psychology at some point. And so that's maybe why this this topic is of interest here. Um, so Naomi, I think uh, one of the questions I wanted to, to have you all, uh, both you and Michael, respond to, and I think you've done at least some of it, and I'll give you an opportunity to, to add on to it there. But Michael, I want to give you an opportunity. I mean, the question that we're sort of pondering is, of course, um, does does uh, what is the exact question? Does traditional schooling lead to poor mental health for students? So uh, Naomi unpacked quite a bit there. I think we kind of got a sense of uh, her answer is, of course, yes. Uh, Michael, what would you add to that? So, first, I loved hearing you live, Naomi. It's been fun following you on Twitter, but uh, 10 times as wonderful hearing you live. So that was fantastic. Uh, exclamation point every sentence. Um, so I'm going to give some specific case studies. Of course, I think for some students, uh, a little bit of data. In the United States, 75% of high school students are unhappy at school. And you think, where else do we force, have a system that results in 75% unhappiness? Um, in a different poll, two-thirds of students in high school are not engaged in learning. So we're forcing uh, kids to go through the system where they're unhappy and they're not engaged in learning. Um, and then in addition to that, I think many of those students have negative side effects from school. So one case study... I worked with a number of children with learning differences where even in a public school with an IEP or say a uh, specialized private school, their experience is that they feel stupid over and over and over again. And one of the things that I've done when I get such students is um, often they're perhaps brilliantly creative and math is not their thing. And so we let them spend a lot of time on animation or video production or some creative skill where they can display their genius. And if they need a break from math for a semester, for a year, you know, if their parents are on board with it, let's take a break from math. And not surprisingly, when they're no longer doing remedial math for the third year in the row, and they're doing something they're great at, hello, they become much happier and well. This is not rocket science, but nobody's talking about it. Um, a very different sort of case uh, is, of course, the bullying issue. I've had students who were um, doing, having a terrible time at school, and when they came to an environment where the peers were not bullying them, they became happy and well. A lot, a lot of this is not magic. It's just nobody's talking about it. You know, school refusers, both Naomi and I have known quite a few school refusers, where kids sometimes, the experience at school becomes so negative they absolutely refuse to go. I know parents whose child would lie like a stiff board in bed, and the parents sometimes would try to force them into the shower and hold them within the shower. I mean, parents will go to extreme uh, you know, lengths because they've been told that they have to send their kid to school. And so I think for some percentage of the population, it is do whether it's uh, feeling stupid, it's uh, you know, the bullying, it's just they're not even sure where they don't go. Actually, another category is lack of purpose. I knew one young woman who was clinically depressed under treatment of both a psychiatrist and a therapist. And I had a conversation with her where I told her, look, you can take AP exams without going to school. And she literally was so surprised, so delighted, she dropped out of school, uh, prepared for an AP, and was happy and well without medication. You know, so the, the kind of meaninglessness and lack of purpose, another thing. So what percentage is it? We don't know. We urgently need to see how large scale is the damage from school uh, for what kind of kids uh, over time. Because ultimately, I think that the both um, adolescent and ultimately adult uh, mental health crises could be reduced with a uh, more human-centered uh, approach to schooling. Yep. 
Yeah, Naomi, anything you want to add to that before I pose the next question? Yes, I would say that I think one of the things, so I was a school refuser myself at two different times in my school journey. And I think the really amazing thing that happened to me was that I moved school so many times. So I actually, at some schools, was really happy, flourishing, doing brilliantly. And then at the next school, I absolutely hated it and had, had no sense of purpose and didn't want to be there anymore. So I think that, again, also really brought in that importance of environment to me, how we can make a difference to so many kids at school and that we have to make a difference in the context going along i think when you talk to many traditional teachers or educators they want to make a difference through exam results they think if those kids get good exam results then they will be sorted their life will be on the right on the right trajectory and i work with adults as well i'm a therapist not just for children i also work with adults so i also know that there are many who've gone through school got those high exam results and have struggled with struggle with serious mental health problems many of which could be traced back to their experiences at school so i think this ranking of young people that we do is profoundly unhelpful for them actually and i think it, it does set up our whole society for kind of ranking each other inequality and a kind of division of people into worthwhile and not so worthwhile people, which I think we learned to do at school. Hmm. Well, yeah, I just ahead. want to d dive in quickly. So I want to validate that hugely. Um, I would say if I see a kid at 12 or 13 who is confident and purpose driven, who has a goal for his or her life, uh, I have I'm confident that kid's probably going to turn out okay regardless of exam results. Or conversely, if a child is uh, lost, uncertain, uh, does their confidence has been damaged, then I'm concerned about them regardless of test results. I, I think this should be obvious, but Naomi is the only person saying it. Hmm. Well, Naomi, one of the things that you, the way that you talked about, um, you know, some of the things that in your in your your uh, monologue there of sorts, the idea that um, you know we're we're sort of sorting kids, and, and as teachers, are we developing talent or are we sorting talent? And I think um, that applies to grading, and which then sort of is maybe in some senses a, a microcosm of what we're talking about here. And you also talked about the cognitive science versus, and I'm not sure how you characterize, you know, the 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 the, the position. What's the right label for what you what you're where, from where you're you're coming from? But that is an interesting dichotomy in terms of pedagogy, of which I have you know really dived into a lot and have learned a lot from folks who are sort of science of learning folks. Daniel Willingham's been on the podcast. Paul Kirchner, all, I mean, these people who are very much in terms of uh, direct and explicit instruction and efficiency and all those things. And of course, I'm a big inquiry advocate and feel like there's a place for all of those things in our schools. So then taking it out, and I guess one one thing I'll say as well is like, so what is it that we're trying to, to accomplish, right? If we, we think about the way that John Hattie talks about teaching, teaching with intent is a term, terminology that he uses. So what's our intent? If we're intent on surface knowledge, are we intent on deep learning? Learning or transfer learning. And so my question to both of you is when we think about purpose and our intent, how would you define sort of the purpose or intent of quote unquote school? And Naomi, we'll start with you. Oh, that's a nice big question to start with. I mean, I think the purpose of school and the purpose of education can be two different things. And that's part of the problem that we mm. confuse the two things all the time. Um, because I think generally often the purpose of school is for people to get good test results. And I would like if that wasn't the case, but I think that is how the government sees it and how many schools see it, because that's what they're being judged on. Everybody's but I think there is also an inherent an inherent issue that school is about sorting who goes on to the next level of education, who gets the funding perhaps to do the next level of education. So and I, I would like it if we were a bit more honest about kids, with kids about that, actually, because I feel one of the more destructive things we do is we tell kids, you can all be successes, you can all do this, it's all about you, you just need to work harder. Hmm. And actually, I would like it if we, if we went in at, when they're starting secondary school and said, you know what, you can't all be successes in this metric that we have set up, that we're going to assess you at the end. You can all be successes in different ways. And let's help you find the way that is meaningful to you. Let's think about what success means for you, because those exams at the end, you're not all going to succeed in. Some of you might become great skateboarders 
or fabulous musicians or artists you're not all going to be brilliant mathematicians and you don't need to be it's like ken robinson i think said in one of his talks you know it's like we're trying to train them all to be university professors we've got university professorship as like the top of every the pinnacle of achievement and that's not just not realistic but it's not even what anybody actually wants to do in many cases hmm. so i think there's that element but the other element just referring back to your talking about cognitive science um I think the thing that is just missed again and again in education is that children and young people don't choose to go to school. They don't have that choice, mostly. Usually it's compulsory. So when we're talking about the science of learning or the cognitive science theory and all of that, you know, I don't have any problem with the science, with the way the studies are done. But what they miss is our young people are effectively being made to do this. So this isn't a science of learning. This is the science of how do we make other people learn. And the, with the science of learning, sometimes they will say that it doesn't matter. Engagement, for example, doesn't matter. Curiosity doesn't matter. What matters is following the steps that should we see from the cognitive model are meant to lead to effective learning. But the problem is that because our young people haven't had a choice to be there, the curiosity and the engagement is what keeps them there. That's that's why they might be there. And I think what happens is when we've got this very rigid learning model, the children won't want to be there, then we have to control them in order to keep them there. See what I mean? So there's a, we have to do the control thing in order to keep them in this environment, which they didn't want to be in, so that we can teach them things that they didn't want to learn which is a really tricky, psychologically really tricky situation. And it's very, very far removed from the science of learning stuff, which I partake in some of those experiments. As an undergraduate, you had to go and learn lists of words in the university. Remember, very, very far removed from that kind of learning. Anyway, I have really digressed there. Sorry. <laughs> um, I can see you nodding, Drew, thinking, where do I take this? Uh, how, well, <laughs> uh, you think, because you look like you might have thought. <laughs> well, I think it's a uh, useful distinction between education and school and again, what are we pointing at? So Michael, how would you respond to that question? So, so many great things. So first of all, Carol Black, uh, who is the screenwriter who wrote The Wonder Years, an advocate of unschooling. She has beautiful essays at her website. She compares uh, the, how, we look, how we learn about how kids learn at school as studying orcas in SeaWorld. And so, you know, there is a science of learning that's mostly how do we get the orcas to do what they're supposed to do at SeaWorld, <laughs> which is irrelevant to the real life of real orcas. So I think that's a wonderful metaphor. Mm. Kind of going back at our school of Socratic experience, the explicit goal is lifelong happiness and well-being of each child. And we make pedagogical decisions based on lifelong happiness and well-being. Um, we have three tracks, creative, entrepreneurial, and intellectual. And the intellectual track is most like school, but probably 60% of our students are more creators or entrepreneurs. And for them, uh, many of them, for instance, don't take conventional high school STEM, because I think for many of them it's a waste of time. And you might think, oh no, then they won't be able to get into college or get a job or whatever. So a uh, couple of examples from the entrepreneurial high end. I have a student who, uh, he works with influencers on social media and he just turned down a job at 16 for $140,000 a year because he prefers to do a 50% rev share of the influencers he brings in. He's gonna be fine, hello, he doesn't go to college. He'll probably go to college, but it doesn't matter. I have another student who, um, was a self-taught Minecraft coder who created a Minecraft mod company, raised 1.1 million in venture capital as a 17-year-old. So these are extreme cases, but the point is just digital work. Um, if you want to not just be a software developer, or but if you want to be a video producer, UI, UX, uh, audio engineer, every website needs more eyeballs on it. If in my experience, lots of teens both are excited about the digital world and become great at it and they can become great at it without doing almost any of regular school. And so we have a lot of kids who are full on creative entrepreneurial tracks, often in the digital world, and they are happy and well, and we just don't force them to take high school chemistry. And kind of, you know, we're kind of uh, as close to the self-directed boundary by, well, still kind of sort of doing school as you can get. Um, one other anecdote, Mr. Beast hated school, 
uh, at the age of 12, began optimizing YouTube, both creatively and algorithmically. Mr. Beast is now worth a billion dollars and has more than an order of magnitude more subscribers than the New York Times. So I see conventional high school, conventional college as irrelevant for many kids, and it's also making them miserable. So let's have let a thousand nations bloom, let, um, you know, uh, eight billion geniuses blossom, and let's go all in to help develop the genius of each particular child. So I can hear... Can I just add, Drew, yeah, can I just say something else there about the purpose of education? Because I think what Michael's just said has really made me think. For me, I think the purpose of education is that young people come out of it thinking, I can learn, I'm capable, I can connect with other people, and I can make decisions that have purpose and meaning for me. And if they come out feeling that, that is what's much more important than a whole string of A's or their GPA or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. uh, so one of the, the the distinctions that I think is important in this, and, and uh, both of you have now uh, raised things that – or said things that I, I can imagine the folks who are sort of on the other side of this issue and the cognitive scientists are – I mean, just mentioning uh, Sir Ken Robinson makes some of them uh, – you know, their heads explode. And, uh, Michael, you're, you say, well, another anecdote. And, of course, they want evidence. They want hard evidence. Um, and so that – those – I just want to just – Plant a flag on both of those things because I'm, uh, I'm imagining their heads exploding and, and sort of chuckling inside a little bit just because they may want to uh, really get after it. But uh, maybe it, uh, an important distinction to make here, at least in, in my mind, is uh, when we're thinking about this and we're, the purpose of education. So part of it is the learning piece, right? So that knowledge and what we want students to leave our uh, adolescence with, if you will, whether it's leaving a, a proper school, traditional school, whatever, or something less traditional. And then the other piece, which is around behavior and some of the rules in, in which we see the, the modifications and the rewards and things, Naomi, that you're re referencing. So I want to start with the knowledge piece and the learning piece, and then we can hopefully get to the rules and some of the behavior issues as well, because I think they're both important. But one of the things that I think resonates with me is, and I don't, I don't agree with a whole lot of what Edie Hirsch, says, or Edie Hirsch says, but the idea of shared knowledge and the importance of that and the cultural importance as we have some things that we all have sort of touchstones, right? It's, it's similar to like having a conversation with somebody who is decades younger than you or something like that or from a different country perhaps, and you don't have those, those, you know, those common things that hold you together culturally and and I do, I, there's some, some resonance there with me. So, you know, when we talk about, and, and, and maybe a straw man version of it is, well, they don't need to know anything, they can Google it all. And I, I don't want to pretend that either of you are saying that, but there's some hints, Michael, the way you're talking about, you know, what do they need to know? And they can learn those things. They don't need, necessarily need all that content knowledge. So, Michael, how do you think about that and, and sort of the role of knowledge and, and shared knowledge? And then, you know, again, some of the the learning pieces that are essential in an adolescent growth and uh, adolescent flourishing, if you will. Sure. So first, um, yeah, I think in elementary school, it makes more sense. I think some of this is a elementary versus secondary it makes sense to be a little bit more uh, knowledge focused in elementary school and it's a developmental thing. And I think especially post puberty, uh, you know, in, in indigenous cultures, uh, often 12, 13 year old, you know, young people be expected to take on a more mature role. And I think a lot of adolescent dysfunction in our society is because we don't um, give them, in Montessori they talk about valorization, we don't respect them as young, powerful, uh, energetic human beings, uh, which they clearly are. So for me, a lot of the issues are different in elementary versus secondary, with high school being a particular problem. Um, and there I would say, yes, some basic knowledge is useful, but my standard is what do most educated adults actually remember? And one of my favorite examples is in the U.S., it is a required standard, uh, both in middle school and high school, to be taught, or yeah, to be taught, I should say, the three branches of government. And yet, um, more adults, more people graduate from college than can remember the three branches of government. So despite this being a required standard, uh, 
it's not even effectively learned by college graduates, which, you know, if, if we have all of these things that kids should learn and nobody's remembering them anyway, why bother? You know, so high level reading, writing, math skills, especially reading, writing, speaking, listening, those sorts of things useful in lots of disciplines, um, math up to finance, personal finance, business finance. More math. I'm a, I love math, so the math resources go for it. But for most kids, not most math is not required. But I always pick on chemistry. I never use high school chemistry. I was great at memorize and forget. So for me, let's dump high school chemistry uh, and most of physics and biology <coughs> and let kids do things that are much more interesting to them. Well, uh, so I can push back a little bit. And uh, Sarah, I know you raised your hand. And, and for anybody who is interested in uh, raising your hand and adding a question, we're going to get to that. I want to do a little bit more on some specific questions and diving into some things. So if you can table that, and I'll definitely recognize you at some point. Thank you. Uh, so as a social studies teacher, I, I taught those three branches of government, right? And one might say, well, okay, so we have very few people or not enough people understanding those three uh, or knowing those three branches of government. And perhaps that's a reason why we are struggling so mightily with our principles of democracy. So what do you say to that kind of thing? So I would say I'd rather teach a few, smaller number of things more effectively. So insofar as say there are certain things, maybe it's just, you know, roughly the base, just in the U.S. context, U.S. history context, what are the basics of, um, you know, the, War of Independence, what are the basics of the Civil War, what are the very simplest basics of U.S. government? I actually think if we taught less and then engage kids' emotions and, uh, you know, this is the Socratic dialogue, we get them thinking, talking, arguing about it, then they actually remember it more effectively. Uh, but one of the problems with all the curricula is there's way too much, uh, you know, Ted Sizer was in favor of kind of less is more kind of thing, very much. Insofar as we have knowledge goals, let's make them very curated, minimal, and do it well. Yeah, well, um, that certainly is, is something that we use and talk about in our inquiry workshops and project-based learning workshops. You know, I use the 50 states and capitals because most people, at least my age, were meant to memorize all those 50 states and capitals, and probably a lot of us did, but, it, you know, I ask you know, adults now. And of course, the reason they don't is because they don't use it. And so are we using it? And that would be my argument for getting to the surface, from the surface to the deep and transfer. And that's a pushback I have in cognitive science and just the science of learning because knowledge and, and then how durable is that? And are we putting it into our memory in ways that has other connections that we can then retrieve it? And of course, are we using it? So uh, Naomi, any anything you want to add to the to the question of the knowledge and, and the role that that plays? Yeah. So, I mean, I think one problem is that forced shared knowledge isn't really shared. It's imposed. You know, when we say, every, like, like the three branches, everybody must learn this. You can't actually guarantee that people can learn anything. You can make them go through a whole lot of motions, but and you can make them. I passed. I did. I was at American school when I was uh, twelve and thirteen, and I did have to learn the three uh, the three branches of the U.S. government. I also had to memorize the fifty states and the capitals. We had to like, put, <laughs> do the, put them all in. Anyway, um, but I think it's an, it's just not case that if we tell people enough, they will learn it. It will be shared cultural knowledge and there you are. That isn't actually how real learning works. Real learning is about things that have meaning to you that you use. And I think the real shared knowledge and cultural capital that our young people need is how people relate to each other and how they make decisions. So when we're talking about democracy, for example, my kids are at a school which is a democratic school. They make decisions together about every aspect of what the school, how the school works. They are learning how to be democratic citizens in a school context. And yet many of the schools that we, most schools, most mainstream schools, do not in any way teach young people to be democratic citizens. They don't teach them to have a voice. And I think that kind of cultural context that we provide is really the shared knowledge that everybody needs. It's how we treat each other in a democratic society, how we treat other people with compassion. And that it doesn't seem to be there. We're, in, we're very much in the let's tell them about this stuff and they'll have it then, rather than actually what context are we creating in which they're going to learn how people interact with each other in our in this society. And I would say that with, with the shared knowledge aspect, what we want to do in schools, my ideal school would be a place filled with opportunities to learn stuff. 
filled with opportunities to learn interesting things which are not imposed on young people but are there as offerings and i'm often people will often say oh well if you're not going to do you know you're not going to have to do a mainstream normal kind of schooling you do nothing it's absolutely opposite of nothing it is learning with them providing those opportunities because learning has meaning when you want to do it and for example if i decide i did learn the 50 states my son hasn't had to learn the 50 states has never been to a school where they have made him do anything like that fascinated by maps he's learned all the 50 states all the 50 state capitals countries of the world because it has meaning to him and he will probably retain that because it has meaning to him. And I don't think we can bypass that meaning. We can't say, you know, the reason we have this shared knowledge is because that shared knowledge has meaning to us. And that changes, doesn't it? Like we had shared knowledge when we were younger, things like how to use a ring phone and how to use dial up broadband, which now has absolutely no purpose at all. Mm -hmm. We just let it go. Yeah, and that's a lot of the work that we do is how do we apply it and, and again, make deeper connections and ask those questions, not just of, you know, again using the three branches but like what are they but then why are they important how do they play out how do we see you know asking a question does the executive branch have more power than it should at this point then there's some need to knows and some inquiry pieces that that pull in there well, let's shift into the behavior pieces which probably gets more pushback uh, uh, i'm guessing on the social media on twitter and, and x than than anything maybe maybe i'm wrong about that but of course the behavior modification and thinking about you know, what are the systems that that schools have in places uh, or in place to to help students they would say help students you know get along and and to ensure a, a good learning environment a safe learning environment all those things and then also i think a, a distinction of like the the individual sort of practice of a teacher right so some teachers are more authoritarian some are more uh permissive maybe authoritative you know i would say is a sweet spot there so i'm curious uh you know the like how you think about like what's where how would you describe some of those those sort of worst case scenarios and then maybe something closer to a sweet spot if you believe there is a sweet spot in a in a more traditional sort of schooling uh, versus you know something that is more alternative or maybe it's just alternative and we should really make sure that we have those options available to those those students who struggle in the regular traditional setting so Naomi I'll give you the first crack at this one Okay, so I see the two things as very much two parts, two halves of one whole. Basically, if you are putting young people into a place where they have very few choices, they don't feel connected with other people, they don't have meaning and purpose, they're going to show us that they're not happy with that through their behaviour. And then, because we've created that environment, we then have these very high control behaviour policies which are coming in and which appear to be spreading through the UK from my clinical most my experience is that more and more people are getting in touch with me to say our school has brought these in our school has brought these in um and the strategies are extremely high control so um there's a lot of focus on picking up the very tiny things with the kind of ethos that if we focus on the small things then we won't have to worry so much about the big things so because in the uk we have uniform it's often about uniform and toilet visits. So there are rules about not being able to visit the toilet during the class time. There are rules about having to have your uniform perfect. And kids are being given demerits of very minor things. So maybe not having their tie quite right. And, you know, and none of us are wearing ties. None of us generally wear ties. But you have kids who have to wear ties. You haven't got your tie right. There's a demerit. You get two demerits, you're immediately in detention. Three demerits, you're immediately in isolation. And I'm hearing an increasing number of people tell me that their children's schools are bringing in this kind of measure, which I cannot see how that can be a psychologically healthy environment to have young people in. And I know that people will say, well, we're just creating nice, calm working environments. But young people tell me from all ends of the ability spectrum, they tell me that this makes them highly, highly anxious. So I have the best behaved girl. I've had a couple of clients, really well behaved girls who are just like, I am terrified all the time that I'm going to lose one of my pens because that will be a demerit and I cannot bear to have demerit. So there's a degree of, well, I think there's a degree of people will say, well, children are families are choosing those environments but because it's spreading there's less and less choice so the area i live in which is devon many of the schools are taking on the same approach so you don't actually have a high control and a less controlled environment 
but I do see them as part of the same thing. So I don't think we could just say, let's just let go of control and it will all be fine. And I completely get it when people say, well, you haven't met my class of 14 year olds. And I, I have met a few classes of 14 year olds. <laughs> but the problem is that we're putting young people into an environment where they can't flourish. And then they're showing us they can't flourish through their behavior. And instead of responding to that and saying, okay, maybe something's up here, we're saying, let's control the behavior. We can't show us anymore. Hmm. Michael, what, what would you add to that? So uh, first, I want to express compassion for teachers and administrators who are stuck in this system because I think they're in an impossible place. And ultimately, I think alternative systems are the only way to go. Um, kind of very broad culturally, you know, I'm very interested in the invention of the teenager. Uh, the word teen and the word adolescent were both invented in the early 20th century. Um, we first see in the United States, compulsory high school only affected a majority of students in the late 30s, 40s, 50s, majority of students graduated from high school, I think only by the late 50s. Not a coincidence, in my view, we saw the rise of juvenile delinquent, you know, rebel without a cause. You know, I think the whole trope of adolescents misbehave is actually an artifact of the fact that we don't have schools that really care for what young people need, the fundamental needs of young people. And it's gotten worse. I think cultural erosion since then, and what's happened is conventional schools have tightened down their control mechanisms. And um, I think that it's ultimately a hopeless game where I see as there's the mismatch between schooling and what an adolescent needs personally and professionally is just going to get worse. I think educational outcomes will become less effective. The adolescent mental health crisis will get worse and worse. And ultimately, we'll need to create alternative systems around the world. Just to speak briefly to that, uh, the younger we do it, the better. I once created Montessori middle schools in Palo Alto, and half the kids had come up through Montessori, half from outside the system. And no matter how... Um, well-educated, uh, you know, quality of student behavior and so forth, the kids from outside the system, it took them a semester a year to learn to work on their own because they'd been trained to be passive and dependent. Whereas the kids in the Montessori system, just like magic, they were functioning purpose-driven adolescents. Um, and so I think, you know, Drew, you're often working with these people who are stuck in the system. Uh, and ultimately, I see this debate we're having right now becoming larger and larger until people realize the old system only works for a fraction of kids at best. Well, there's there's a, there's several tensions, at least, that I can think of, and maybe some of those I can use as pushbacks here. So, obviously, you know, Michael, you recognize the compassion and the sort of tricky situation a lot of teachers are in, right? And behavior and school behavior, in-school behavior of, of students seems to have degraded since covid at least if you pay attention to the to the the bylines on twitter uh, and I, it seems to be true um and so we obviously want our classrooms to be number one safe and there's some questions about that in some settings we want them to be good for learning and you can talk about what those learning environments look like and the outcomes and the pedagogy and all of those kinds of things uh, and then there's also i would say you know the idea that we want to instill discipline and sometimes students are are uh, they're they're young people and i would argue i have two daughters there are things and rules and things that i ask them to do that they just don't like to do right and you know like that's okay we don't want to over coddle them we don't want to uh clear the the lawn for them or the what all the different helicopter and lawnmower parent analogies one might use uh, so how do you address those kinds of things? I mean, like if cognitive behavioral therapy, one of the things is to challenge kids and to, you know, the exposure therapy. And so we want them to be resilient. We want them to meet challenge. We want them to, uh, this is something that, that I say to my daughters fairly frequently, you can do hard things. Uh, now there's the intrinsic and extrinsic motivation and are the things worth doing and all those kinds of things. So I've thrown several things out on the table as sort of pushbacks, but it, you know, we have a we have a reality in many cases where teachers are in situations where maybe restorative justice is what they're supposed to be using, and it's maybe misapplied. Uh, that you know, students are being able to do what they're they're able to do whatever they want, and it's just sort of degraded. Uh, so you don't blame them for being sort of punitive and saying we've got to put this down and and be able to to 
to function uh, to be able to make any progress in any any uh, meaningful way. So, like Naomi, how would you uh, respond to those kinds of things? Which bit of that? <laughs> the yeah, first one about there. Me, there was lots. I mean, the thing about resilience that comes up. So Michael said something which I really liked, which was the purpose-driven adolescent that when you see young people who come through the system of where it's never been taken away from them, where they've never been told you've got to do what I say and what you do, what I think you should do is more important than what you think you should do, always, I mean, I'm not saying that it isn't, sometimes it is more important what an adult thinks a child could do than what the adult child thinks, but as a consistent thing for all of their life, what I think you should learn is more important than what you think you should learn. The difference when they get to adolescence is really striking. You can really see it. And that wasn't something I was expecting. When I, my children stayed out of school and I now know lots of young people who haven't been to mainstream school. I see really purpose-driven adolescents, ones who are doing very difficult things without being forced to do it because they really want to and it's never been taken away from them the kind of drive has never been taken away from them so i would agree with michael that we need to start this early this needs to be right from age five when the, in early years and actually early years, we get it pretty right, i think we need to be continuing those principles of helping creating a context within which young people can learn but i think there's always distinction with young people where we want them to be resilient and meet challenges but we want those to be the challenges that we set for them really so for example i know many young people who are very resilient and will set really high challenges for themselves within video games and those are completely not valued as goal setting or resilience or challenge by the adults around them we want them to be resilient when it comes to doing things like their maths homework and i think that's a basic problem that we've got where it's the adult intention and then we're saying you have young people you're not resilient because you're actually not doing what i want rather than choosing to do what you want which actually i think is quite resilient behavior saying hang on a minute i'm not going to do what you want i'm going to stick to what i want so i think there are all sorts of different ways of reframing that um and i've lost track of all your questions because there were quite a few in there <laughs> yeah i put a lot on the plate there uh michael you did, yeah. yeah anything that you'd like to respond to there <laughs> Sure, I, I would say my frame really is um, educators as mentors or coaches, and this gets into your resilience question because, you know, we want if the goal is happiness and well-being for every child, uh, I would say that I have seen some teenage boys who are addicted to video game playing. So while acknowledging the goal thing, sometimes it's an addiction, and you know, if we try to force compliance to your math homework, they'll force compliance is always a minimal compliance, and they always try to you know, pretend to do the work, you're never gonna get great results with forced compliance. But the conversation I and my staff might have is, hey, um, you know, what are you gonna do after high school? Um, you know, you're gonna go to go college or not? Totally okay with both options. If not, you know, how are you gonna uh, earn a living? You know, and they don't have to know, but we want them to take it seriously because if they can't earn a living, they're probably not gonna be happy and well. And ultimately it gets into, well, do you wanna be playing video games in your mom's basement at 30? No, at 25, no, 20, probably not. At 18, maybe not. You know, and ultimately um, they do, they want life. They want a vibrant, happy life. And so especially if you give them the degrees of freedom they need, it's like, oh, what I wanna do is I wanna be a content creator on YouTube. Well, let's let's try to you know, knock your socks off, see if you can make that work. We're all in to help you. But whatever it is, once we're aligned with their purposes, then the coaching mentoring relationship becomes beautiful and we can help them achieve great things. Hmm. Well, then the pushback I can hear then is that we say, well, we have adolescents and kids you know, there's a sort of a meme that, you know, kids know what they want to learn, they know what they want to do. I have two daughters, 15 and 16. My oldest seems to think she wants to be a teacher. I'm not sure if I want to persuade her or dissuade her one way or the other. Uh, my other says, you know, I'm not really sure. And I remember myself as a ninth grader, like I don't remember have having any particular understanding of what I wanted to do and, uh, and, and not even knowing what was out there in, in many ways. And so whether it's learning or sort of uh, a bigger picture of what we're talking about here, is it your contention that most adolescents, if given the opportunity, would be able to do that? Because I, uh, I'm sort of skeptical of that. And maybe there's some things that you say, well, if these other things were in place leading up to that, then yes, maybe that would be much more likely. So uh, how do you think about that? 
So uh, again, it's what's there. If they want to go to medical school, clearly they need to be cranking on the STEM courses for sure. Um, if they want to be a professional musician, well, you know how hard it is to make a living as a professional musician, and let's really examine this. And are there some uh, ad musician adjacent careers you might be interested in? So again, it's mentoring and coaching with the wisdom of you know knowing knowing the adult world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I would also say that something like high-level reading and writing skills, speaking and listening, are very valuable. Um, and so I make the case to young people, you know, look, at some point you may be signing contracts. Probably useful to know what the contracts are saying, more or less. Even if you hire a lawyer, uh, you know, you want to be the one who knows it. And, you know, you should know enough about finance that, you know, people aren't going to screw you over. You know, and so there's some basic general things that I find most students are actually really interested in learning about finance. And once I've explained they're interested in becoming better readers and writers, especially if they can write whatever they want to write, uh, and we're not constraining them at all, but they see the value of verbal skills. And then beyond that, it is uh, what's the path towards your success? And really, again, being all in in terms of helping them with a realistic goal. And that includes being realistic about professional athlete, really tough, professional musician, really tough. You know, live it, make a living off YouTube, really tough. Um, and, and just evaluating the probability of various outcomes and having plan Bs that are effective. Okay. And Naomi, you can respond to that, but I want to throw something else out. Um, and I think I sort of alluded to in, in my earlier diatribe, but the idea of punitive uh, sort of disciplinary kinds of measures. And uh, my, my, as I understand it, you're essentially find those to be very troublesome. Uh, but I don't want to mischaracterize your thinking and your words, but what do you, what advice or what thoughts or distinctions or important questions might be useful in thinking about those students and those classes that might be made up of students who don't have that uh, like they their homes haven't really instilled discipline and they're disruptive and perhaps dangerous and all of those kinds of things so punitive and you know very strict environments can help with that at least in some way and certainly might have these side effects we're talking about but how would you like that's the sort of criticism right so very strict environments there's a dip so there's a difference with behavior so a lot of the time when you talk about behavior in schools, people will say, well, we're using a behavioral approach. You know, they need, they're going to learn how to do this. I don't think that necessarily a lot of young people who are subject to a lot of punitive strategies in school are actually learning how to behave. What they're doing is being controlled. And that's actually different. So as a psychologist, if I put in place a behavioral intervention for somebody and I might do that, then I would expect that behavioural intervention to become increasingly unnecessary over time. So we'd say, okay, we want to chat. I've done this particularly with children maybe who are nonverbal or who have learned disabilities. We'll put in place some behavioural things to try and change their behaviour. Maybe it's self-harming behaviour or something destructive. Over time, we should see that change and we should be able to withdraw the control because they are internalising it. What I'm hearing in schools is that there are punitive strategies which are being used for some children a lot. So some children, I talked to a little boy who was in their primary school detention for 28 days in the last term. If that's happening, I think it's very unlikely that this is a genuine behavioral intervention. There's no intervention happening here. This is just punishment. And I think we're not good in schools at distinguishing between, is this an intervention to help them learn to do something differently? Or is this just punishment? Because if it's just punishment, what you're doing is you're making that child feel bad about themselves, probably for something that they can't help. So a lot of the time, unfortunately, I think schools aren't particularly child-friendly environments in terms of thinking about the developmental stage. They expect children to do things which they find hard at each developmental level. And then when they find it hard, they get punished for it. And that isn't how they're going to learn how to do those things better. What happens instead is they develop shame and anxiety about not being able to do it. And then years later in adulthood, they still have that shame and anxiety. I sometimes say, I have shame and anxiety about fractions, right? So we did fractions at school when I was about seven, found them really, really hard, just could not get my head around fractions. I'm, I love maths. I did further maths at school. I did, I got, you know, I did, I was a high performer in maths later on. Still, when I think about fractions, I have a kind of sense of anxiety. 
from a hangover from when I was seven. And I meet too many people who have hangovers about all sorts of behaviors and things that they just were too young to be doing at a certain age. And because they were punished for it repeatedly, nobody was looking at why can't this child do this thing? Why? And I think if you've got a child who is struggling to behave in a class setting and they've got 28 detentions in the last term, somebody needs to be saying, hang on a minute, why is this not working? Because it's not working. We could put this child into detention for the next five years and they could still be doing the same things. Mm. And that's the sort of feedback loop that I was talking about. I think we need a feedback loop that says, okay, <laughs> detention might be something that dissuades a kid from doing certain things. If that's the case, fine. But if we're just using this repeatedly as a way to control the class, then it's not the case. And what I hear with some of these high control schools is that they will say things like, you know, we have everybody strictly under control all the time and we can't trust them to go to the toilet because their behavior will be so appalling. So I'm like, so what are they learning then? They're not learning to behave because if they were learning to behave, you could trust them to go to the toilet. Because the weird thing is that we trust four-year-olds to go to the toilet. In fact, we encourage them to go to the toilet, <laughs> you know? We And yet by the time they're 14, they've lost that ability. Why is that? And I think high control environments, it's, it's a kind of myth that it helps you then when that control is removed. I mean, one of the things I did as a psychologist in the National Health Service when I worked with adults was I worked with military veterans. Very, very controlling environment. They'd often been in that environment for years and then they came out of that environment and their life fell apart for many reasons but their life generally fell apart it wasn't the case i mean obviously i saw the people for whom things have gone wrong right that's what people always say you see the people for whom things have gone wrong yes i do but there is a recognized path with something like the military or the police high controlled employment where people manage fine in that environment you take it away it isn't that they then carry on behaving in that kind of highly disciplined way. It's not like you can just train people and they will just keep going. I don't think we have the evidence that that's, that's what happens. And if that was happening, then in these high controlled school environments, by the time they're 15 or 16, 17 or 18, you shouldn't need the control anymore, should you? You've trained them. They've, you know, for, as a psychologist, the amount of time schools spend on with kids is so huge compared to the amount of time I might spend. If I do a behavioral intervention, I might see someone once a week for 10 weeks, and that would be quite a lot. But your, you know, schools see kids for 30 hours every week. So if these behavioral interventions were really working to teach kids how to behave differently, we should see the results in a way where we didn't need to do it anymore. And I don't think that's what's happening. Just to interject, the, the other thing, totally agree with all of that, but the other obvious thing is young people, especially males, need a lot more physical activity. You know, I've seen so many boys who are misbehaving and uh, often getting in, you know, medicated with a for ADHD and they're also getting into disciplinary cycles that can somewhere, sometimes be a downward spiral. And if they had more physical activity during the day and more breaks and didn't have to sit Again, it, it, we're putting them in an impossible situation than medicating and punishing them. Mm. Yeah, well, yeah, all the way through the school system. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and again, lots of that resonates with me. Um, I'm thinking about it in, in, in several ways. One which maybe is helpful here, and, and Sarah, I'm going to ask you to unmute here in a moment. And I know you had a question, and anybody else, if you have questions, please. You know, I think if you raise your hand, I can unmute your uh, – exactly how Google Meet here works. But, you know, one of the, the things that is very true about this – education system as a whole, you know, for, for all parties involved is there are various parties and systems that don't, aren't, aren't as effective as they need to be and should be. Some of those are parents, some of them are teachers, some of the systems, some of the practices, all those things. And if you put it in sort of a context of something I heard, I'll probably butcher it a little bit, but uh, liberals versus conservatives and sort of a, a political ideology or, or I guess uh, maybe not politics per particularly, but liberals are sort of trying to create an ideal world and uh, conservatives are trying to put things in place to keep the worst from hurting us and, and making it, you know, uh, really, really bad. Uh, now, it's a simple way to think about it, perhaps, but I can imagine some of that pushback of like, okay, so w we're talking about idealistic kinds of practices and things that that uh, don't actually work in reality, and I think that's a big pushback, and of course, you know, like, 
it, when those of us who have them, I, mean, I have two daughters. I don't do any of those punitive things. I've never grounded them. I haven't done those things. We talk about things. Uh, we very rarely do any yelling or arguing. Certainly some discussions. Uh, certainly sometimes when I put my foot down and say this is what's happening, um, and which can lead to some friction. But uh, I'm just curious, you know, to think about those kinds of distinctions. So, Sarah, if you would, I'm going to give you an opportunity to unmute. I know you had a question a while back, and thanks for being patient. And then anybody else um, who. Who, uh, wants to add to the conversation here thank you very much first of all I want to thank the three of you for putting this on it's really um, I've, I've felt my face go really red a number of times because <laughs> I feel so passionately in agreement with what you're saying um, I was a teacher for 25 years and it saddens me to use the past tense but I ended up having to leave um, because I just couldn't believe, I mean, I'd been from different angles. I'd been, you know, just a normal teacher. Then I'd become um, like a head of year where my role was essentially, you know, contacting parents when kids had received too many demerits for uh, uniform infractions and things like that. Um, I think what's pretty clear is that the system generally uh, in mass, I'm, I'm here working in Portugal, um, it doesn't work. I'm seeing here a massive influx of parents coming from California, from the UK, from all over the world and spending shitload of money to send their children to really expensive international schools where there's a lot of well-being terminology being thrown around. But they're essentially, in my humble opinion, inviting trauma into their children's lives. Now, I quit teaching. I'm setting up a big like summit, an education summit for parents, because I've tried to make a difference to schools from the inside. And I have been told, yes, let's start this initiative, but do it on top of your already ridiculous workload. And so what advice would you have for me? Because I find myself in a position where I just want to punch everyone in the face. I'm actually not a very <laughs> person. Um, and when I when I feel so strongly about things and I'm trying to talk to parents about, oh, you know, your kid's been put on report, but was, was your kid really needing to go on report for sitting on his chair in the eighth hour of the day? Um, and now the mum is getting herself some counselling because she thinks that it's because the relationship with her husband not being so great is, is trickling down into her child's behaviour. And it's just like, oh, my God. People just need some education in school and out school on what well-being is. How can we do this without it being branded a unicorn, rainbows and fairies kind of issue? Because I just find myself... <laughs> so is there a question in there, Sarah? Oh, there, actually, there was a question here at the end. What I'm sorry. What can I do? Yeah. What can <laughs> so, I actually do? I mean, I've left I was, teaching. I was distracted I'm... by the sound effect. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've got a piece that may be helpful. So one of the, in the U.S. at least, I would say high school is the most uh, conventional and uh, anxious. You know, the alternative school movement is stronger in pre-K through eight. And then in high school, most of it becomes very conventional and we get the sort of things you're talking about. But at least for U.S. universities, they actually, most of them don't care about conventional high school grades. And that may sound shocking, but um, I've gotten kids admitted to all sorts of universities, including those selectives. And my university admission strategy is threefold. I only mention university admission because parents were okay with their kids, you know, working in a startup. They're easy. But one is... Um, you know, great SAT scores, so SAT matters. But if you get them reading difficult material, the SAT verbal is going to be okay. If they need to be prepped for the SAT math because they want to get to university, let's go ahead and do the SAT prep for math. So kind of shameless, if that's the metric, let's do it. A couple of college courses are AP courses. They don't need 14 APs. They can have three, and that's not a big deal over four years of high school. But the other big piece for college admissions is an amazing project. So... You know, my kid who raised 1.1 million as a 16-year-old, he got into Stanford. Hello? Stanford once highly successful young entrepreneurs. Um, I have students who did music concerts, wrote novels, um, published articles in, you know, 
prominent websites and so forth. So the purpose-driven sort of activity we're talking about is a college admissions credential. Uh, there's a man named Cal Newport who has a book called How to Be a High School Superstar that has a similar strand. But I'd be happy to connect offline, Sarah, and give you lots of stuff on the old system. You know, one other tweak on that. I, I know uh, consultants who try to help your child become interesting to get into a good college. And I'm like, wait, you, you want to kind of hire a consultant, help your child be interesting, let your child pursue their interests and develop them to a high level, and then they will be interesting. <laughs> so there, there's a whole college admission strategy that's totally in support of what you want to do. And once they're no longer anxious about college admissions, then it's much easier across the board. And Naomi, I'll have, uh, if you have anything to add to that, but I just put in a chat, and Michael, you mentioned Stanford, so I recently talked with a 19-year-old young lady who talked about a project. She's actually at Stanford, and she's got this project to do uh, uh, learning, basically learn, uh, build learning structures and things in, um, in uh, you know, poor countries and that kind of thing. I'm not saying it very gracefully and eloquently, but Sophie Rue, and it was a really interesting conversation to talk about her educational experience and the empowerment uh, that she experienced and and some of the struggles. And, and she we actually talked about that knowledge piece as well. And what she uh, mentioned that I think is really, really important is she says, there's lots of this stuff that I don't know. I'm talking to experts and people about how to build these things in foreign countries and get things shipped and all the things. She said, I don't know those things, but I can ask good questions. And that's so, so important. So Naomi, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that before we go to the next question. Well, I mean, I suppose my operating system at the moment is that most people don't acknowledge there's a problem. And so really what I'm trying to do is to say, hey, there is a problem. And mostly what I get is people saying, no, there isn't, be quiet. But from my perspective, that's what needs to happen because I think most governments, for example, don't see a problem at all with what's going on. Like certainly in the UK at the moment, the problem is thought to be attendant. Let's get them back into school as if school is in itself a benign, ever good thing, which once we're there, they're there, the problems are over. So. I don't know how we can do something differently, but all I think is we have to keep saying that there's a problem, that there's a problem, that there's a problem, no matter how much we're told to shut up. Okay. Well, thanks for that question, Sarah. Uh, the next question, he's listed as Contraband Wagon. His name is Will. I uh, know him, uh, so I know his name, so I'll, I'll give up your secret there. And Will, uh, if you want to unmute and ask your question. Hey, brother, it's not a secret. I appreciate it. <laughs> My name is Will Fullwood. First, last name. You can have it all, y'all. No one's hiding. Uh, the, the Contraband Wagon is my uh, podcast, which is how Drew and I became acquainted. Um, so, uh, first of all, Naomi and Michael, thank you guys so much. And Drew, thanks for hosting this. Um, this has been a really interesting conversation for me as a professional educator for since 2006. Um, and I've also been involved in education politically as well in the United States and will continue to be in the future. And so hearing this conversation is, is also interesting. Um, there's so much I could say. I mean, like I, uh, <laughs> I took a lot of notes here, but I'm just going to go ahead and deal with, I guess, one, one aspect. Um, I think that a dimension of the conversation that's missing here is the history of education, of public education. Um, it's not a mystery that there's a mismatch between what children need and what the education system provides. That's how it was designed. It was literally set up like in a way that was not going to give children what they needed. That was not the intention. Um, what we're encountering in 2024 and beyond is this battle about do we want to change the intention of our schools and what our schools values are that's really what's going on right now and that's why people are saying shut up shut up shut up now because um the values that we've built the current education system on um it's mixed up in a lot of money and that's another aspect of the conversation that we seem to be overlooking. But like, ultimately, that's why you're being told shut up, shut up, shut up, is because money is funneled in certain ways in the education system, and it's connected to the way these schools are run and the policies that ends up being ultimately 
being asked to be enforced at the school level. Um, and so I think that what's happening right now, and Drew, this is why I appreciate you having this conversation. The conversation about this issue is too stratified, okay? There's the student teacher level, there's the administrative level, there's like all these parties from the outside, there's the political and governmental level. This is the same conversation we're having in different dimensions and it needs to come together into one singular conversation. And so that's why I bring it up the way that I do is to try to help people hopefully realize that this is about changing values of our society as we've grown. <laughs> Um, from what we were when we established the system. And now it's going to be this battle between do we want to acknowledge what we've learned about children's mental health, about what students need, about how learning and human flourishing happens, and the conflicts that we've recognized in the system that we set up originally. And it's not like this is only contained within the education sphere, right? Like we're doing this in a lot of different contexts outside of education as well. Um, so this is just like, you know, humanity growing pains, I guess you could say. And unfortunately, there's a lot of, aside from the difficulty of collective growth um, and, and the complications in that, um, I think that there's also the fact that there's a lot of people who only care about the money that they can pump out of this system, whether that means that we keep it the way it is um and students continue to suffer the consequences of that it doesn't really matter to them so you know that's a huge barrier i definitely agree with naomi that we need to just continue saying that there's a problem but the government knows there's a problem i wouldn't say that they're they're ignoring it they know there's a problem they just this is how they're dealing with it right this is how they're dealing with it and so like ultimately the only way to push back against government power is like pushing back with greater power and then the government listens that's how it works so ultimately this is a it needs to be a political movement probably an international political movement so um i'm just gonna throw i i don't know if that was like just dropping like a grenade and running but like you know that's 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 what i have to offer in what i'm gonna take in like a short time thank Thanks, you Will. michael oh. naomi anything you want to respond to there so, uh, you know, first of all, I'm very much in the United States in favor of educational scholarship accounts, ESAs, such as Arizona has a universal one where the money follows the child, even to homeschooling or self-directed education. And one of the reasons I specify that is for me, a big problem is the grammar of schooling. Um, you know, the notion that this is what third grade looks like. This is what fourth grade looks like. It's divided into math and social studies and language arts and science. And this is what the textbook looks like. And this is what the accountability system looks like. As long as we're stuck within the grammar of schooling, um, we can't change. And even most educational software produced is designed around the grammar of schooling. So if we want fundamentally new models, we need to let, going to your point, will the money follow uh, the child uh, to new completely new alternatives are outside of the traditional grammar of schooling yeah, yeah I mean, just one, one point one point on that real quick michael i hear you brother and i get why you're saying that but i do not think that that is a feasible way of going and i just want to be open in saying that because i think it's important like most students go to public school like we cannot just ignore that reality like most students go to public school it makes way more sense to deal with the problems in the system where students already are than to try to funnel students to different systems, like just logistically. And like, ultimately, if I thought that that was reasonable, then that would be amazing. Like, I, I, I just think that logistically, that's not like a reasonable path forward, just like the numbers wise. I just have to oh. say, sorry. Bring, bring me onto your podcast. Let's talk about it there, but I'll let Naomi go. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Will, for that lens. I like that idea that it's about the growing pains of trying to change. Are we trying to change the trying to, we're saying, do we want to change the intention of our schools because they were never designed to meet children's needs? And I think there's it's it is about values. And I think we've got this big clash, certainly in the UK, between parents and changing values in parenting, uh, which haven't been mirrored by changing values in schools. So parents are treating their children quite differently. A lot of parents are. And they are, I think, this whole 
you know, parenting has become much more of a thing and there's people are worrying about their child's emotional well-being and all of that kind of thing. And that's quite a recent thing, really. And that hasn't happened in the schools. And so we've got this really quite distinct clash. But I think there's also something else there about that you say the government know that there's a problem and you're right, they do. But I think they think the problem is children and parents. At least that's the impression I get where we are that the problem is just the people if they would just behave differently and could conform better then it would all be fine and maybe there's something below that as well but there's certainly a lot of yeah that's what i i find all the time is that we we locate the problem in the children we blame the children and then that carries through with those children for their whole lives thanks for that naomi um laura and i we're getting close to wrap up time here but um, i want to make sure that laura gets her question in and then we can wrap up hi um thank you so much for hosting this i'm so excited to be able to have this conversation with you all because there um i find myself i'm in michigan and i find myself constantly swimming upstream and trying to spread the message and it is through Twitter and Instagram that I've been able to connect and watch and follow Naomi and Michael both re read your books and try to spread that message. Um, I am a 30 year veteran of public education. I left the minute I could um, secure my pension <clears throat> and um, because I too felt complicit. It was a system that I watched damage um, children, my own three uh, included. My husband is a high school principal. And so our kids were raised in a home of, of genuine learning and interest. And they love to this day, they love to learn. They hate school. They hate school. They begged me over and over to homeschool them to do something different. And if I could have financially, I would have. But um, my, when one of my kids, um, who was older for his grade, needed more out of kindergarten than what our district was willing to provide, I was forced to make a choice and I chose my child. I pulled him out, I put him in Montessori and he thrived. He wanted to learn and was being held back. And so then my third one went through Montessori and it is by being a parent of Montessori and watching it work that I, as an educator, said, why aren't we doing this in, at the secondary level? I was a high school English teacher. And so I started taking those concepts and putting them into practice in my high school classroom. And it transformed me as, as a teacher, as an educator. But then what I saw over you know, the next 20 years was I was, sp I spent so much time trying to undo what they learned about what it is to be a student, which is to be passive, which is to not know, which is to let someone else do the work. And so, um, and not to mention that the other five hours of their day were traditional. Um, so what I was able to do, however, is reach kids who never passed an English class and they were passing. And I had mothers contacting me saying, what did you do to my 16 year old son? I came home, he was reading in a chair, no TV, no device, like what is your magic? And I'm like, the magic is to treat them as humans, <clears throat> to care about them beyond their number. What, what I was able to do is gather so much data from my kids, especially when the pandemic hit about their mental health and all of this craze of um, get them back to school, their mental health. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. There are so many kids whose mental health is so much better now because they're not in school, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the idea that I presented all of this data and I said, our kids are struggling to my administration. What are we gonna do? They wouldn't even respond to my emails. And, and, and decisions are made for them that are not in their best interest. So I left. So what I'm trying to do now, um, my oldest went through and I saw him spend literally 95% of his life on homework, 
you know, do the sports, be the captain, be the organizational chair, do this, do that. He played the game. It burned him out. He got there. My third one had a very different experience based on what I learned, which is AP classes are not a curriculum. That is a specialty. But even better, dual enrollment at the community college is more beneficial. So my youngest has five out of his six classes at the community college, takes a full load there for four semesters, got into the same university, the same honors college, and was offered a professorial assistantship. And he took not one AP class. So my whole goal now, my mission, is to share everything I've learned from the inside because I, Sarah, relate to you. I tried to move the beast from the inside. It's not budging <laughs> on its own. So like um, Will, I think it was, who said, I'm trying to get a parent movement going. I'm educating parents about the dangers, the harms, the alternatives. Even if you're stuck by being in the system, how to make the system work for you and for your kid. And so I'm looking at like the brain body connection and teaching them about the brain and development about physiology, because our mental health crisis is really a very natural response to very unnatural circumstances. Mm -hmm. So why are we not teaching kids about breathing? About their breathing techniques to reduce some anxiety, right? About the alternatives and, and so on. So I feel like I'm preaching to the choir, but like this is my life's work. My mission right now is to save other parents from sitting outside their kid's door in the middle of the night praying they don't kill themselves because they're trying to teach themselves AP health through because Zoom is glitching and their teacher is not coming through and they're being held to that same standard of be a data point. Kids feel like data points because teachers' pay is linked to the kids' success on the SAT. Well, thank you for that, Laura. And Michael and Naomi, I'm going to give you a, a moment to, to say any last words and respond to any of that. But first of all, I want to thank both of them for engaging here. Uh, when I reached out to Naomi, who I did not know before, uh, she responded, and we had uh, a good conversation to talk about it. And there's always a risk of, uh, and there's actually been some folks that I've invited on on this, and then some other things are like, I don't want to deal with all the the craziness and nastiness. So appreciate Naomi for uh, for engaging, and of course Michael as well. But we'd been on a podcast before, so we had a little history there, and um, and I would encourage you all to uh, to continue the conversation. You know, the reason we started the the community is to continue to have these conversations. Uh, we'll do these events. There's other events that we've got lined up that may or may not be of interest particularly to you. But to get folks an opportunity, you can engage uh, asynchronously, sort of the Facebook kind of thing. I know it's going to be uh, a heavy lift to get enough people in there. So if you, you have folks that you think might be interested, definitely invite them. Um, I've posted uh, the bulk of the content in there at this point, and, and uh, certainly that's not going to work. And uh, certainly would love to, to see additional uh, pieces in there. And if there are other uh, other uh you know, questions. I'm curious, any feedback that you have for this conversation or the community or ideas. Um, there's the email address community at thoughtstretchers.org. Um, our professional development is at wegrowteachers.com. And um, now I want to give uh, Michael and then Naomi the, the last word here before we sign off. Well, first, thanks to all of you. Um, I really, uh, we are probably mostly preaching to the choir, but, um, you know, La Laura or Sarah or Will or anybody else, uh, I'm super passionate about this. Anything I can do to kind of help your efforts, and we do need a parent movement, we need a multi-pronged movement, we need an educator movement, therapist movement, all kinds of people movement. Um, I, I think that this is one of the most important moral causes today. Uh, I think things are only get worse if we don't change it. So anything I can do to support any of your efforts to move things in the right direction, feel free to reach out. Okay. Naomi, anything else? Yeah. 
thank you, Drew, for bringing this together and for inviting me today. It's been really nice. Um, you never quite know. <laughs> you know, I've had I've to learn quite a lot of resilience myself um, on Twitter over the last few months. Um, but I think it's really important that psychologists can't be complicit in this system by saying there's something wrong with the kids because there's nothing wrong with our kids if they're in an environment where their needs aren't met and they're not flourishing the fault is not them the the problem is is the adults we need to do something to change the environment so that our kids can flourish well again thank you all so very much um and i I see will had put his email address in there obviously uh you're all part of the community and uh, i don't think there's a group that or forum that is specifically set for this but i'm happy to create one that uh, community at thoughtstretchers.org you can email that comes to me and if you say hey let's get a group or forum and it would be helpful to do that um by all means please do that i'm happy to to be a place where those conversations can continue. Um, But uh, again, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm not sure if this will be out as a podcast or or video or or both, but um, my goal is to continue to have these kinds of conversations about important topics in education and uh, appreciate the the engagement and uh, your participation. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you. Bye. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.